This is an amazing group. Don't go away, don't go away. I want to make sure you know, because uh, we, we don't always get a chance to tell you who they are. This is Ed, who plays keyboard. Thanks, Ed. And Diane and Shar and Alice and Cheryl, who are always up here at the microphones leading us in worship. It's awesome. Thank you. Most, most of you know Mike Snow. Mike is director of our worship. And, and Mac, you got to hear him featured on guitar this morning, and he did a fabulous job. Thank you. And I know that Jesus is all right with him. Uh, Dave, Dave jumped out. He usually hides behind the, the, the drum set. And, and, and Dave is also the, the, the band leader, which is awesome. Uh, you get to hear Ann with the violin. A couple, couple weeks ago, it sounded more like a fiddle. It did, yeah. Beautiful. Dan, uh, Dan's playing bass, and he's always there, and he's got it just right. And does a beautiful job. And somebody told me one time, the guy that always up front smiling as he plays, do you know that guy? That's Ralph. <laughs> yeah. Thanks to our band. Thank you all. Great job. Beautiful. They lead us to the throne room to worship, which is beautiful. I, I counted there are 11 of them. Just enough for a football team. They actually did better than the Penn State team yesterday, which was really hard. My wife is a, a Penn State graduate, and it was a heartbreaker. But I know there are a lot of Ohio State Buckeye fans here, and my dear friend and colleague, Pastor Mike, is thrilled. I <laughs> uh, know he's happy. <laughs> worship. Okay, worship, worship. That's right, worship. God is in the business of calling. God creates, and God calls us. Um, I appreciated the time with children this morning and, and uh, Digger talking a little more about Samuel being called. God also creates and calls Jeremiah when he was a youth, still very young. Now, Jeremiah continued to serve God as a prophet, a spokesperson, um, late in life. Some estimates say that he probably lived to be about 90 years old, um, which would mean maybe that he was serving God as a prophet for 75 years. Through most of his career, uh, I'll just go ahead and put the title slide up here, called to speak up. Through most of his career and his Old Testament writings, which are the book of Jeremiah, his name, as well as Lamentations, Jeremiah really doesn't have a rosy picture for the people of Israel. Instead, much of the time, he needs to try to confront or redirect the leaders and the people. Um, for example, when the land of Judah was caught between world powers of Babylon and Egypt, Jeremiah had to warn the king about dangerous alliances and strategies that would doom the nation. Jeremiah also was called to challenge idolatries and the moral decay of his time. He had tough messages to deliver. If you go to the dictionary and you look up the word Jeremiah, Jeremiah, it will tell you it is a prolonged and mournful complaint. Hmm. Obviously, it's, it, that word is, is taken from the name Jeremiah because he had such tough duty telling the king and telling the people um, and warning them when it was a dark period of their history leading up to uh, the defeat and the exile to the Babylonians. It was a tough time. And... Jeremiah had a difficult role, challenging. It all starts when he's a youth. Let's read in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 to 10. This is the call of the boy Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. 
Then I said, oh, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to over, overthrow, to build and to plant. Let's pray. Lord God, please put out your hand and touch my mouth and supply the words that you want spoken this morning and open our ears and our hearts to hear you. We pray in the name of the word, Jesus Christ. Amen. Beginning about two years ago, this small plastic figurine of Martin Luther became the best-selling toy in Germany. Yeah. In fact, the first run of it, when they, when they made 34,000 of those figurines, the first run, sold out in 72 hours. Now it's zooming toward a million sales, and it is the all-time bestseller for the company Play Model. And they've sold a lot. They have sold a lot. This is their bestseller. Even they admit that they're shocked by the market, by the demand for a 16th century priest with a quill, a writing quill in one hand and an open Bible in the other, he has outsold all of the superheroes and all of the other popular characters. On October 31st, 1517, 500 years ago this Tuesday, Martin Luther famously nailed his 95 theses or things that he wanted to question or discuss or debate, 95 of them he, he nailed onto the door of the Wittenberg Church. Those 95 criticisms of the church became a watershed moment for what we know today as the Protestant Reformation. There were certainly things that were leading up to it and there were things that ensued afterwards, but it's kind of a watershed moment demarking the beginning of the Reformation. And so this is, a, this is an anniversary week. Now Luther, did, he, he didn't intend to launch a new branch of Christianity. He really wanted to reform from within the Roman Catholic Church. But things really spun out of control quickly. His impact as a writer and as a theologian and as a church leader, that impact is colossal. Uh, one of the hymns that we're singing at the other service is a Luther hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Classic hymn by Luther. He also translated the Bible into German to make it available to an increasingly literate laity. He wanted to give the Bible to the people. In fact, this figurine has it right because that open Bible is not in Latin, it's in German. He wanted to make it available for the people to read. And he championed the notion of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ a champion of that fundamental conviction of our faith. Now, 500 years after the Reformation, we are still trying to move beyond the bitter conflicts between Protestants and Catholics. And believe me, our, our mutual respect and collaboration has risen to new levels. It's, it's very encouraging. Even Pope Francis has participated in major events to commemorate this history and to acknowledge that we are fundamentally one in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. But our, our task this morning is not to narrate the Protestant story. 
what I, what I want to make sure that we've done is appreciate the courage required for a relatively obscure priest and professor to make public his criticisms of the church and take on the power of Rome. When Luther did that, the Pope at his time formally charged Luther, threatened him with excommunication, and also banned from the empire. Now, the, the trial, if you will, the trial of Luther lasted nearly four months. It was presided over by none less than the emperor, Emperor Charles V. And Luther stood his ground. Before the ecclesiastical and imperial authorities, he admitted, yes, he had written the statements that Rome found so offensive. And the Pope had warned him, unless you recant 41 of those statements, you are under penalty of the church. Luther refused to recant. It was a dramatic moment, according to those who were there as witnesses, when Luther gave his very famous response. Luther said, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything since it's neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Amen. And when he took that position, when he took that stand, Luther was not only excommunicated from the church, driven out of the church and never allowed to participate in communion or in the salvation that the church offered at that time. He was also driven out. He was banned from the empire as, a, as an infamous heretic, as an outlaw, which meant that anybody who spotted Luther could kill him without legal penalty. And no German was allowed to provide him with any food or shelter. His sympathizers whisked him away to a safe refuge. Luther's life continued another 25 years. Luther's legacy continues today. It's why so many of those little figurines have sold. Luther sensed and answered a call to speak up even when it would cost him dearly. He laid his life on the line. He continued in the tradition of the, of the prophets, speaking up when he saw something that he thought was contrary to Scripture. And, and he challenged the church. He put everything out there for what he thought was true and faithful. We are called to speak up. You and I, we're called to speak up. As followers of Jesus, we're called to speak up. In some respects, that comes naturally. The next service, uh, we'll be baptizing Charlie Noel Holm. And I look forward to holding her and baptizing her. I've known her since she was born and her parents, and it'll be a great privilege uh, to have that moment with them here at North Lake. And I can tell you that, that Charlie, in her own fashion, has already learned how to speak up. <laughs> Just shy of eight months old, she already knows how to speak up and to communicate when she's hungry or when she needs a diaper change. Right? It's pretty natural for us to speak up when we need something or want something ourselves. The view from the back of our house overlooks the 14th green on the golf course that winds through our neighborhood. And it's amazing how many times I've heard golfers speaking up. <laughs> A 
about what they want from the golf ball. <laughs> whoa, 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 slow, 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 slow down. Or go, 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 go. Or come on, come on, come on, break, break. Yeah. Those are the ones I can repeat. <laughs> Some even add their own body English to this <laughs> to communicate with the ball, you know? <laughs> You know, I haven't seen a single ball take instruction from a golfer after it leaves the putter. <laughs> haven't seen it happen. But that doesn't stop them from speaking up, trying to let the ball know what they want. I've known a few golfers who would talk more to their golf ball than to their spouse. <laughs> you know, actually, it is important to share or to, to speak up. With our, in our closest relationships, to speak up and, 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 and to share what we're, th what we're thinking or feeling or needing. That's really important. To let our loved ones know. I believe that when Bobby and I were early in our marriage, we thought it was unselfish not to speak up about what we were thinking or feeling or wanting. Not that, well, this is unselfish. I'm not going to ask for that. After a while, we began to realize that doesn't work. <laughs> if for no other reason, I can't read minds. And I could be pretty obtuse, picking up on the hints and the clues about what I should know and do. The relationship, our relationship, is so much more mature and healthy when we speak up and, and, and talk about what we're thinking and feeling and needing. It's, just, it's a much more mature relationship. If you're served the wrong order at the restaurant, you'll most likely speak up and tell the server about the mistake, politely, right, nicely. But you would, and, and, and so the same clarity and courtesy should be extended to those around us to speak up and, and let others know to speak up. Speaking up, we, we all have the capacity to do it. Sometimes we lack the courage to do it because we're afraid of making waves or afraid of what the repercussions might be. In the prelude to this message, the email that was sent out on Thursday, I cited the uh, classic children's tale by Hans Christian Andersen about two swindlers who posed as weavers and offering the emperor a brand new outfit. You know the story. They cleverly told the monarch that they were using a very fine, luxurious fabric that was invisible <laughs> to anyone who was foolish or incompetent. And so while, while the swindlers are measuring and fitting and, and dressing the king, no one, not even the king himself, admitted they couldn't see the clothes. <laughs> no one spoke up to say there's no clothes there. And the vain emperor arranged an elaborate procession before his subjects to display his new outfit. <laughs> People along the parade route were shocked and silent because nobody wanted to speak up until, at last, it was a child who didn't know the consequences of speaking up, who blurted out, but he isn't wearing anything at all. And that classic tale, 180 years old now, reminds us we need to have the courage to speak up. Take some courage sometimes to speak up. That's what Jeremiah did. He was delivering difficult messages to royal and religious leaders. And because he spoke up, he faced venomous hostility and mistreatment, including an extended time in prison. It was not easy. Speaking up, that's what Martin Luther did. Challenged in the church and things that he thought were contrary to Scripture. It can be hard to speak up, 
right? It can be really hard. It may be easier to speak up when it's something that we need. It's, it's hard to speak up when it's somebody else who needs something or where we see some injustice. At the scene of an accident or a crime, often eyewitnesses will be reluctant to say anything for a variety of reasons, maybe personal safety, maybe they just don't want to get involved. They're reluctant to speak up. Speaking up can be risky. Some prefer to remain quiet. That was true for many as the forces of Hitler and Nazism were rising in Germany and there were religious leaders who saw what was going on and and who just wanted to kind of keep quiet and stay out of the way. Stay out of the way. Some who even opposed Hitler's regime, but they waited too long to speak out. Martin Niemöller was a Lutheran pastor. Initially, he thought Hitler was bringing a lot of new answers and solutions for their troubles. Before long, he, he realized that what was happening was an attempt to co-opt the churches to purposes that were really not related to the gospel. And Niemöller also saw how many people were being victimized and mistreated. And eventually he became a, a, an outspoken, outspoken opponent of the Nazi regime, which cost him seven years in a concentration camp, and he barely survived. He escaped execution himself very narrowly. After the war, after his release, he expressed his deep regret that he hadn't done more to speak up against what was happening. His most famous lines were these. First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Niemöller finally understood that we are all called to speak up when we see someone being bullied or harassed or mistreated. As followers of Jesus, there's a calling for us to speak up. And certainly, we're called to speak up for Jesus Christ in a culture that is increasingly hostile to to religion in general, and to Christianity in particular. We are called to speak up for the Lord in ways that are, that are bold, but also loving and respectful to speak up and, and share. I mean, this is not a license to be obnoxious. Right? And sometimes folks behind the guise of the Internet or different, you know, go on the attack and it becomes very uncivil. This, the, the lack of civil discourse is deeply alarming. I'm not talking about that. I'm, what I'm referring to is, is, a, is a boldness, a, a confidence to speak up and acknowledge our faith in Jesus, even when that may be a sore spot for somebody else. I believe we can do it. Make no mistake about it, Jesus challenges us to speak up for him. He says, what I say to you in the dark, tell in the light what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. In Acts 18, verse 9, it says, One night the Lord said to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silent. Speak. Don't be silent. It can be hard, dangerous, costly to speak up. But that's part of our calling as followers of Jesus. Our Lord knew that the road ahead would be perilous for his disciples. He knew that. 
That's why he also reminded them that, reminded them and us that the hairs on our head are numbered and known to God and that we are far more precious to the Lord than, than all the sparrows who were caught up in the Father's care. The same God who formed us in the womb and knew us before we were born and who calls us into life and, and we're baptized and we have, a, we have an identity and we have a calling in God. And God provides the words to say and the courage to say them. That's what God did for Jeremiah and did for Martin Luther and Martin Niemöller. Do not be afraid, but speak. Do not be silent. Way back at the beginning of September, we began this series on calling. And and we read in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, we read there that we are holy partners in a heavenly calling. Actually did that right around the communion table. That was the message that morning. We are holy partners in a heavenly calling. We are partners in Christ, holy, consecrated, set aside for God's purposes. And we share a calling that leads faithfully through this life and finishes beyond this life. And that's why Jesus says, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Our God is sovereign. His love is from everlasting to everlasting and exceeds anything we see in the moment of threat. As we conclude this series, I I hope you've grasped what I said at the outset and have tried to emphasize. Um, I want to make sure you know calling is not just for pastors or those who go to seminary, right? I hope that's abundantly clear. It's for all of God's people. The Lord beckons all of us to follow and serve in various ways. The ways that we serve Jesus will change through the years. And I, I look forward and wonder, what will Charlie be called to do? as a child, as a youth? What will the youth and the students who are here and the children, what are they being called to do now? Even now, being called to do, what's the calling? Or for a young adult or for new parents, what's the calling? For those who are in mid-career or those who are newly retired, or maybe those further on in years, because You never outlive your calling. You never outlive your calling. You never outlive your calling. You don't. Your calling is not concluded until God's final call heavenward. Let's pray. God, thank you for creating us, forming us in the womb, and and you knew us before we came into this world, that's astonishing to us. It's almost incomprehensible, but your wisdom, your knowledge, your plan, your purpose, your call is there and it shapes us. So help us to hear it and to follow your call. Jesus, you walked along the Sea of Galilee and you called and people answered and you still call. Help us to answer and to live in ways that are pleasing to you listening to others and speaking up as we have need or opportunity. To your glory we pray. Amen. Amen.